Okay, uh, no one else is on campus? Okay, before we begin, any, any questions from last time? Um, sir, in the last class, at the very end, you gave us a simple language to make a CFG for. Okay. Um, but I am a bit confused about how to make a CFG. Like, I know how we can uh, make a PDF for that one. But can you please show us how we can make a CFG for that particular example, if you remember it? Uh, what was the example? Do you remember that? Uh, yeah, it's a language uh, which consists of all strings of A's and B's such that there are more A's than B's. You were supposed to make a CFG and a PDF for this one. Yeah, so were you able to construct PDF for that? Yeah, I, I understand what we have to do in this one, but I just don't know how to make a CFG. Okay, so CFGs, uh, I mean, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. So it's not easy to construct CFG because um, you have to be, uh, you have to do a lot of stuff and it, it, there is no algorithm to construct CFG. So you have to do many different trials and errors, right? Uh, so the language was that, suppose A is a language that contains uh, all strings over AB uh, such that there are more A's than B's, right? So um, we know that the sigma over here is just A and B, okay? Uh, and let us consider S as our start variable. So it means that in our grammar, all such substitution rules should be such that whenever we apply one of the substitution rule, it should add, so if it is adding a B, then it should add at least one A, right? So there should be, uh, there, are, there have to be more A's than B's. So, so we need to ask certain question, is, is empty string part of the language or not? Uh, empty string is not part of the language because empty string contains no A's, no B's here. So the number of A's is equal to number of B's uh, and it does not satisfy the condition. So empty string is not there. So what about the string that contains just one A? Yes, it is there. What about the string that contains uh, two A's? Yes. What about all those strings that contain uh, only A's? Yes. Uh, so the number of A's can appear in any position. Uh, they could be in start, they could be in end, they could be in the middle, uh, but the only condition is that the number of A's must be more than number of B's. Suppose S is the variable, uh, S is the start variable. So how can we define how, what should, uh, the strings in this language look like? A, A. A, okay. A, A. No, I, I'm talking about the rules, not the strings. Oh. E, S, B. Suppose we, I say that S is a starting variable, which can be A, S. Right? And then this S can be anything either as ABS or ABS. So we can have any number of, uh, so, so for example, if I substitute this, if I apply this rule, these rules, then we know that every time we apply this rule, uh, we will have, uh, we will have uh, same number of A's and B's, right? Same number of A's and B's. 
but we know that we have to start uh, so okay so we have we, we have to start with this one okay, so let, let let me refine it let me refine it. so let's say s is a s and this means that we can whenever we apply this rule uh, we would have uh, we would have is just is right Okay, so we can, let's say we can change it to T and this T is A, B, S, or A, S, B, or B, A, S, or B, S, A. So this particular grammar will contain all strings which have at least, uh, which will have more A's than B's. This is one possible solution. There might be other possible solution, but this is one, one possible solution. Sir? Yes. What is the question? Sir, why did you put that T over there? Uh, again, what's your question? Uh, you put a T in the line S is S arrow A T, right? Yes, yes, this first row. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about the dead T. If, why, why did why did you put dead T there? Okay, so the thing is that we have to go and look at the description of the language. It says that all strings over A B such that there are more A's than B's, right? So whenever we apply any rule, uh, we need to make sure that the number of A's we insert is either I mean it is it should be more than the number of B's that we insert. If we just look at this 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 uh, this rule T, then this to read rule T. Uh, will add a one a one b over here 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 in, in any case it will add one a and one b right but then it also gives us the option of adding s right and this s whenever we add this s s is has only one option that is a t okay or you may call it it, it should be t a so whatever uh, whatever when, whenever you apply this s we know that there will be one more a than whatever we already have, right? So this is how we would satisfy this condition that uh, it has to have more A's than this. Okay, so we have to look at this description. Sir, so there is uh, no particular method for for making a CFG? Yeah, there is no, uh, there is no, uh, general algorithm to construct a CFG. No, no, I still don't understand. Things. Sir, can you hear me? Yes. Sir, so I still did not understand uh, why did you put uh, that T there? Uh, what? Okay. So A is a language that contains more A's. So let's call it. contains all strings over a b such that there are more a's than b's Okay, how would you construct a grammar for this? Suppose S is the starting variable. How would you construct a grammar for this? Yes. Do you have any idea? What A? I'm just asking. Do you do you understand the question? No. Is it the first time you are in this class? No? No, sir. Uh, I, I do understand the question, but uh, I'm having difficulty with CFD. So I think it's B. It will be. Please yes. wait. Excuse me. Please wait. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So how do you construct? Yeah, so what is so I'm saying what what should be the rule? You have no idea? Why? I cannot hear.
No, I still don't hear you. Please, can you speak louder? You haven't studied this topic. Uh, have you attended my classes? He's preparing for what? Okay. Anyway, um, yes, so. Sir? Yes. Can we put A plus T instead of AT? A plus T. What is A plus T? Y plus? Sir, we just want, sir, we just want to show that A is, uh, there are more A's than B, right? So A You're plus T means. A plus T, right? This? What is this plus? Yes, sir. What is this plus? Sir, uh, I added this just to show that there are more A's. T can be anything. It means B, B can be empty. Does right. our language L contain plus in any way? Does this plus, I mean, does this plus belong to our sigma? Oh, sir. So then how 80. can we have A plus? Yeah, sir, I'm wrong, 80. Yeah, it, it cannot, right? So hmm. we need to come up with rules. Suppose S is the start variable, so our rules start with S. So S must be the first rule. It must be the first start. It is the start variable. So the first rule must start with S on the left hand side. So we want to have strings of A's and B. And I, I think we all have done a language in which we have equal number of A's and B's. Do you remember that language? Do you remember the, um, uh, do you remember the grammar for that language? You don't remember? Anyone? Yes, sir. Okay, what was the language? What was the grammar? Mm. So I don't remember the grammar exactly. I'm looking for it, wait. Um, sir, it was... Zero, uh, epsilon one, like this, I, I remember. So we had a language L, which was zero N, one N, such that N is greater than yeah. zero. So what was the grammar? Sir, A so it was A S, um, we used two different grammars and then we uh, took the union of it in this example. That was a different example. A zero and one and right? Isn't it the grammar? Isn't it? The, are not these two rules? These two rules are enough to to describe or, or to generate this language. Because each Sir, I think, yeah. of these two rules will generate each and every possible string in this language. Because MT oh, yes, yes, belongs yes. to the language L. So this is taken care of by this rule, right? So when we apply this S substitute six epsilon, so this rule, this is done. This is set aside. Every other string, we know that we can apply this rule. S substitute zero S one. So whenever we have this S, we can apply as many times as possible, as many times as we want. But one application will give us one zero and one one. So that is whenever we apply this rule, uh, the number of zeros and number of ones will increase in the same quantity, right? So if we have zero, zero, one, one, then we know that we can apply this first rule twice. And the third time we would apply with, with empty and we would get the string. So all the strings which are generated by this grammar are exactly the same string which are in this language. And in this language, there is no string which cannot be generated by this grammar. So this grammar exactly describes or generates this language, right? right? So this is how we, this is how we design grammars. Now the question is that rather than having this language, suppose we have a language L, which consists of all the strings of A and B, such that there are more A's than B's. Okay. So imagine that we redefine this language and we say that. Sorry, we redefine this language language and we say that we have a language a that contains all strings 
all strings over a b such that all a's are before b's and there are four a's then b's so do you see any difference between this language a and the language l that i defined previously yes sir there is so the difference is that all a's appear before b's it is impossible so for example we have a b uh, this is not in the language but a a b is in the language previously a a b was in the language a b a was in the language b a a was in the language because in, in all these string three strings there are more a's than b's right so all these uh, satisfy this condition they were in the language but now i say that okay this condition remains uh, but we have an added condition and that is a's must be they must come before a so it's it's a bit restrictive than the other language can you construct a grammar for this So the first yes. rule would be A T. A T. A T. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can. The second would be T equals to A S B. I I cannot hear you properly. Is this? T T then T S B. Plus, where is plus? Why do we get plus again? S S. No, no, plus S S. Not plus S. A S B. A S B. Okay, that's it. And then sir, uh, or A B S. No. We cannot have A B S. I think this should be the F only F one. Then, then epsilon. E equals to epsilon. And then epsilon. Epsilon. Yes, sir. Okay, now this language, this grammar will generate this language. A. Why? So if we forget about the first rule, then the second rule is the one which constructs all the strings of A's and B's such that there are exact number of A's and B's, and all A's are before all B's. But with because of the first rule, which is A S, uh, which is a, S is A T, we know that. We need to apply this rule first of all, and whenever we apply this rule, we know that we are adding a, but we are not adding b. It means that whatever strings that you will generate from this, they will definitely have more a's. Right. Uh, but sir, every correct? time that we need, is this correct? Sorry, sir. Is this language correct? Uh, the grammar. Yeah, is this grammar correct? I think so. It should be, sir. I think it is correct. Okay. What do you think about A A B? Is it is it in the language A or not? A A B. Yeah, it is in the language. Can you derive this string from this language? Uh, yes, sir, it is not in this language because uh, A and B has to be the same number. No, no. The language says that there are more A's than B's. So this string is in the language, but yeah, I think we're missing something in the grammar. Are you the sure? variable S would also go to epsilon, right? No. Oh yeah, sir. We can. Uh, first, we will take the transition. Oh, sorry. Also, using S, rule. S applies A T. Sorry, uh, this one. So if we if we apply this one, so since we have A A B, so this A is this A. So the remaining thing must be T, right? Yes. So this yes. T is A, A S B. Yeah. This so S should also be able to go to T. Why? Because then we can substitute the S with T, and then T goes to epsilon, so we can have A. B. Uh, S would be also equal to no. This is this is the, this will be a problem. S will be equal to epsilon. There should be another one. So what is the problem? Yeah. 
So when that, you substituted uh, if, in this. Sir, if T is the start symbol of the language, then the string will be a part of the language. But if S is the start symbol of language, then I don't think this can be a part of the language. Because if S will go to epsilon, then it will create problems. Because then empty string will also be a part and it shouldn't be because A should be more than Bs and empty string has equal number of A's and Bs. Now we are, okay. So in the second step, we had A, A, S, B. And then you replace the S with just a single T. We don't have any such rule. Yeah, so let's, let's revise it. No, I think this is correct. So for example, A, A, B is the string that we start. So S starts with A, T. This goes to A, A, A T, B. T. This goes hmm. to A, A, Epsilon, B. A, A, Epsilon, B, yeah. It's no, correct, right? it's correct. Yes, sir. This is correct. Yeah. Uh, this is correct from for this one, but there is still a problem, and I can see the problem. And the problem is, um, what about sir, B A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A that's not in the language, right? So that won't be in the language as well. Okay, okay. Can you drive this string? Sir, can we make a transition like T equals to A T? Okay, what would you say? Sir, we can make this a uh, string. Yes, but with this grammar, it is not possible. Yes, it is, I guess, I just do. No, this is not possible. For example, if you start with the first rule. Oh yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So this grammar makes sure that it has exactly one more A than B. Yes. So since there are two more A's than B, then it is not possible. So what you can do, so as, as uh, what's your name? Uh, so Roshan, as Roshan suggested, I think we can add one rule over here, and that is just a t. This rule will allow us to have as many a's that we want. Right. So see, the problem is that when you are when you are uh, writing grammars, when you are designing grammars, uh, you have to. There, there is no algorithm which you can uh, which you can apply, uh, but there are some tricks and techniques which you can apply to get the result. Uh, but in most of the cases, what you need to do is you need to think about the strings that are in the language and then come up with a pattern and then decide what rules should be there. And once you have some rules, check if uh, all corner cases are handled with this and you will be able to generate all possible strings. So you have to go uh, back and forth and, and modify your camera here. And there. So there is no general rule to design the cameras. So I usually don't give Excuse such a because uh, this is... This is the problem because it's it's not there's no static way of, of generating a design of that. Yes, what's your question? Sir, sir, uh, is it possible for us to describe a CFG for a particular period? 
Like if we have a PDA, can we drive the CFG for it? Yes, there is a way. So what happens is in many cases what we, uh, so the thing is, uh, there was a theorem which we, we did not go into detail, which says that every context free grammar has a push down automata. Uh, but before that, I skipped a topic which is called Chomsky normal forms. Chomsky normal form is a technique uh, which we can use to convert any context free grammar into a special form. And once we have a grammar written in that special form, that can be converted into a PDA very easily. And once we have a PDA, we can always convert that PDA into, into the grammar. Uh, yeah, so there are some ways, but not uh, no direct way. There is no direct way. Okay, sir. Okay, so it is, it is much easier to construct a PDA than to construct a CFG. Okay. And it is more understandable to construct a CFG in case where the rules are defined in such a way. For example, uh, when you are designing a language, for example, a computer language, C or C++ or Java or Python, uh, in those cases, we know exactly what kind of strings the language will have. And over there, we define the program, the syntax of the program. So over there, it is, it is a little bit easier in the sense that we know how to design it. Uh, but in general case, yes, it is too difficult. It is difficult to do that. Anyway, uh, so how would you uh, learn these new techniques and tricks uh, by pra practice? So I think I have provided you some practice questions. Uh, did you attempt them? Yes, sir. Sir, I have a few questions regarding those, uh, but I was thinking about emailing you for that. Okay, uh, what's your question? Uh, okay, in question number three, uh, the question second, has given uh, us... I, we have a question from the classroom. Okay, sir, okay, sir. So, sure, okay. Yes, what's your question? Oh, yeah. oh sir, uh, in question number three, we were given an NFA, and the question asked us to describe a language for that NFA. And that NFA was quite complicated. So I just needed to ask you, is there any specific method for doing that? Uh, I don't remember what was the question. So let me. It's question number three. Okay, um, well, you need to think about it because it, it may look complicated, may, but maybe it's not that complicated. So follow the- I tried, but it was like very confusing at one point. Okay, fine. Can we do this example some other day if, you're, if oh, you okay. have the time? Uh, after the class, I mean- uh, Okay, sir. And, okay, sir. and one more question. In yeah. question number six, uh, they have given us some regular expressions and they've asked us to make a DFA for each expression. So can we directly make a DFA for a regular expression or is it necessary to make an NFA first and then convert it to a DFA? Um, you don't have to construct an NFA first. Uh, you can directly construct a DFA if you, if you can, fine, that's possible, why not? Okay, sir, thank you. Any other question from kind of one of you or from, from Zoom online? Okay, so let me see if there is anything on the chat. Sir, ek sawaal hai regarding the example that you just gave. Uh, andar, sir, if we put a transition in the B, and then we take that to B or epsilon, will that work? I don't know. We need to check. Okay, so let's try it. Check if it is, if it is possible or not. So I cannot answer that question because I don't know. I haven't tried it. Okay. okay uh, sir, try it. I have some announcement uh, later to uh, exam. And the announcement is that we will have our exam during Thursday's class. And exam will happen this way. So first of all, I would rename this exam as midterm exam because there's some regulation from IBA that there should be a midterm exam and a final exam. So rather than calling it exam one, I would call it midterm. And uh, this exam will happen this way, like we did in the quiz. So I will release this question maybe five minutes, 10 minutes before the class time. And every one of you who is present on campus should come here and do it physically. Okay. 
and every one of you who is not present would do it at your home. Uh, and I would assume that you would do it honestly with, without, any, without cheating. Uh, so when whoever is present will do it physically on paper and submit it to me and everyone else will submit it uh, online, for example, what, whenever they are finished, they just uh, take the pictures, make a PDF file and upload it on LMS. Uh, for everyone who is present in the class, I will accept their exam as is, but for everyone who goes the online way, we will have a separate viva for them, an oral exam, based on whatever that you have written. That would be from 5 to 10 minutes, would be 15 minutes, individual. Sir, so the viva will be based on the answers we submit or uh, some other questions regarding the topics? It could be anything related to the exam. It could be anything that we have studied so far that, that was covered in the, uh, in the exam. Okay. So all the topics. So how much time will be given? 5 to 10 minutes. Not so far exam, I mean. Exam, uh, I haven't decided. I think we will have right around one hour exam. Okay. So we will have one hour. Sir, how many questions? It doesn't matter. Uh, you will. You should be able to uh, solve all those questions in one hour. So if you prefer that you want to do it physically in class, please come and, and have this exam in, in this classroom physically. Write it on a paper. And that's it. When is it, uh, sir? When is it scheduled? Fine, you, you have to appear in Viva. Yes, what's your question? Yes, Amar, what's your question? Sir, when uh, is the exam scheduled to be and what will be the given time for the exam? I, I told you that it will be on Thursday, day after tomorrow. Sir, could you please move it to Saturday? No. Sir, we already have another mid on uh, Thursday. Could you please move it to Saturday? I already told you that we will have exam either on Tuesday or Thursday. Saturday was never in the Okay, course. sir. Right? Okay, sir. Okay. So we will have the exam on Thursday in class. So everything till CFG in context free languages. No, nothing that we will cover today. Okay, just let me know if you are interested uh, in online, just uh, otherwise, uh, so, so that I can print the proper number of uh, copies of the exam. Sir, so yes. the on-campus yes. exam will be on the same time? Yes. Um, sir, can you please give an option for an online exam then? Yeah, yeah, online exam is there. So if you don't want to come to campus, you can have it online, but then we, we will have a viva. Okay, sir. So I will be on the same day. No, not on the same day. Maybe next week. Okay, sir. Okay. So should we email you if you want to take an online exam? Uh, yeah, I can create. Um, uh, maybe I can create a Google Sheet, and so you can just choose to do it online or on campus, so that I I know okay, the number sir. of people, number of students who will be doing it on campus so that I can print the uh, appropriate number of exam copies. Okay, sir. Um, sir? Yes. Will there be a viva for, to be, uh, for the students who give the exam on campus? No. No viva for, for students who do it on campus. Yes. Okay, thank sir, you. CFG is included. It depends. If I think that there should be a choice, I will give you. Otherwise, whatever. Yeah. Yes. What else? Any questions? Okay. Uh, so let us start with theory machines. And um, we are going a little bit faster because it's just week number four and we are already on theory machines. Uh, the reason is that it's just an eight weeks semester, right? So we are already in the middle of uh, the semester. So we are rushing and there are more interesting things to do with the Turing machines than to do with Automata or CFGs and other things. So, so we will spend more time on Turing machines, maybe around two weeks on Turing machines in, in related topics. And, and the rest of the time we will spend on uh, the later part, which is the complexity theory.
uh, anyway, so there is one complaint I have, and that is uh, there are no uh, I mean, no more students present here on campus. Uh, so if you want me to continue coming to campus and take hybrid classes, please uh, do come. Otherwise, uh, I would prefer it online, and uh, we, we should go with, with that more. Uh, anyway, so so let's see. Let's talk about uh, Turing machines. So what are Turing machines? So as I as we started um, in, in the beginning, I told you that we, in this course we'll be talking about uh, computational models, and so far we have seen two computational models explicitly, and one of them is the uh, finite automaton, and the other one is the pushdown automaton. So pushdown automata and finite automata are the uh, computational models that we have seen so far, and and both of these models are are elegant. Uh, they can solve some computational uh, problems, but we have seen that there are some computational problems which cannot be solved by finite automata uh, because fine, because of the limited uh, limited capacity and limited memory of, of finite automata, and for that we go for push down automata and then push down automata can solve some other computational problems uh, which cannot be solved by finite automata. Uh, but then we have see, already seen that there are some languages which cannot be accepted or there are some computational problems which cannot be solved using push down automata. So we need even a uh, bigger computational model. So Turing machine is a computational model which is much more powerful than any other model that we have seen so far. Uh, and later on, maybe today or maybe tomorrow, uh, in, in the next class, we will find out, or this week, you'll find out that uh, Turing machines are actually the most powerful computational model that we know so far. So it is the ultimate computational model that we have um, acquired or we have understood about, uh, we have understanding about, and um, this is the most powerful. And why it is most powerful, we will see that why it is most powerful and how, how can we use it to solve many different problems. Okay, So Turing machine, as I said, are more much more powerful models and they are very similar to finite automata, uh, but finite automata has limited memory while Turing machines have unlimited memory. Okay, And it's not just unlimited, it is also unrestricted. Like finite automata have limited memory, and they, that's also restricted. But in push down automata, we have unlimited memory, but that is restricted because that memory can be accessed in a in a form of a stack. Right? A stack can grow any uh, any any of any length. It can go infinitely large, but uh, it has to be restricted in a sense sense that the memory can uh, can only be accessed in a stack a stack manner. While Turing machines have unlimited memory. So it can be infinitely large and it can be accessed in any manner that we like. Okay. So, so Turing machine is, is a much more accurate model of a general purpose computer. So the, the computers that we know uh, that we use and we know uh, we have been using them for very long, uh, these general purpose computers are, are, I mean, properly modeled by Turing machines. So Turing machine is, a, is an accurate model, which model uh, these computational problems in, in, in a more, uh, I mean, accurate manner. So what is a Turing machine? So Turing machine is a concept. It's, it's, it's not a physical machine. It's not a physical uh, computer. Turing machine as finite automata, as we discussed, finite automata and push down automata. So these machines are mathematical models. They are mathematical machines. They are not real physical machines. They do not exist in reality. So Turing machine is, is, is no different and Turing machine is also a mathematical uh, formal, formalism for computation and to model computation problems. So what is this Turing machine and how does it look and how it, does it work, we will, we will just see. Uh, but maybe it's, it's better if you can do a little bit history about Turing machines and Turing himself. So I hope you are all familiar with the name Turing. Right? So Turing was a mathematician he was famous, he's famous for his computer, his work in computer science. And some may regard him as the father of modern computer science. And uh, Turing machines are named after Turing. And he was also famous for his uh, code breaking during the Second World War, 
uh, the Enigma machine and so many other things. Uh, so he was a student in Princeton University in the United States. He was from UK, but he was a student in Princeton University, New Jersey, and where uh, he was a student of church, Alonzo Church. Alonzo Church was again another mathematician and at that time there was no such thing as computer science, uh, but he was working in a, in, a, in a direction, in a field which you can call computer science, theoretical computer science of modern time. Anyway, so Ch Church was working on <coughs> Excuse me. Church was working on some problems where he, he formulated a model of computation. Uh, we will not go into that model of computation in this course. I covered that model of computation in some other classes. Uh, it's, it's called a lambda calculus. Uh, we will not go into, into that model. Uh, but Turing was, was a student and was also working on uh, similar problems and he independently came up with, with a model uh, which later uh, became, uh, I mean, it, it, it later uh, became known as uh, Turing machines. So what is this model? So Turing machine said that he was interested in some computational problems. And we, later on, we will see that at the turn of 20th century, there was a mathematician named David Hilbert. Okay, we will talk about David Hilbert in the later part of the course where we talk about, I mean, the limits of computation, but David Hilbert was a mathematician, very famous mathematician. And he posed a question, actually a sequence of questions, a list of questions to a Congress of mathematicians, uh, which happened in, I think, turn of the century, it was somewhere, I think either in 1900 or something like 1901. In that conference, he mentioned some problems that he would like the answer to these those questions in the next 100 years. So he presented those problems to be solved in next 100 years. So he, he thought that by year 2000, and, and remember this was being uh, talked about in year 1900, 100 years before year 2000. So he, he came up with a list of uh, problems. And one of the problems on that list, which later uh, famously became known as the Hilbert strength problem, uh, was about, it was not about computers, it was not about creating machines and finite automata, it was about solving some kinds of equations. And what that mathematician Hilbert was asking for was actually to come up with an algorithm. But at that time, since computer science did not exist as we know it now, so nobody knew what, is a, what an algorithm is. So. So they tried to answer that question in many different ways. And Turing was also trying to answer some of that questions. And uh, so Turing in 1936 in his one of most famous papers came up with this idea which, which, now, which we now call Turing machines. He said that, imagine there's a room, a big room, and there is a mathematician sitting inside this room, mathematician. A mathematician who knows how to work with, uh, I mean, he knows how to write, he knows how to read, and he's intelligent, he's, he's uh, smart. And this mathematician who is sitting in this room is given an infinite supply of paper, okay? And infinite supply of pens or pencils or ink or whatever that you uh, can imagine with which he can write uh, on this paper. And that paper actually comes in, in a roll of paper, in sheets of rolls. For example, uh, like the toilet paper. So we have sheets which are rolled, right? So there are infinite supply of those rolls and, and he has access to the, that paper, one paper at a time or a one block at a time. So you can imagine there's a, there's a huge tape or a huge roll of paper, uh, which is like this, it's an infinite supply. This paper is divided into squares or units. Okay, and the mathematician can only—I mean, he he or she wants to look at one block of that paper at a time, not more than one, just one block of the paper. You can imagine that this is one sheet of a paper that the mathematician uh, wants to use. On this sheet of paper, the mathematician is allowed to read whatever that is written. Mathematician is allowed to write whatever he wants to write on it. 
and then after that he has done his his work he can move on to to the next sheet of paper and once he's done over there he can either decide to go back or go forward so he can decide to go to the right direction or to the left direction so it depends on the mathematician that what he wants for example he wrote something on a paper moved on use another piece of paper wrote something and then he wants to use the, utilize the results that he he wrote in the in the last sheet of paper so he would go there read it come to the next paper and continue working so with this model turing claimed that whatever computational model that we can imagine can be solved by this mathematician if we imagine that this mathematician is smart enough to solve the problem and then later on we see that it is not even necessary to have that mathematician inside that group we can replace that math mathematician with a mechanical process a process just that just simulates the working of a mathematician without need of any intelligence or smartness and you would still achieve exactly the same kind of results and you will be able to solve any computational problem that we can imagine using this computational model and later on this uh, this this whole scenario turned into be became known as turing machine and i will explain that what the turing machine is okay so let let me define turing machine very formally okay so what happens is in a turing machine there is an infinite supply of tapes so this tape is is a, is a sheet of you can imagine as a sheet of paper which is which is divided into blocks and each block can contain one character it's it's a sheet of paper but we can write just one character on it okay no more than one character just one character on it and that character will come from the sigma and it will come also come from some other alphabet which we will call call gamma and this gamma i think you are familiar with what is gamma from push down automate right and there are some other characters that we will define later on so this in inside a turing machine so you can imagine this this is a turing machine it's a black box and in this black box there is an infinite supply of the tape okay and there is some input which goes to this machine and this input whenever this input goes there this input is written on the input tape so we call it the input tape so this tape is called input tape okay and the mathematician or the controller which is sitting over there can access this tape one square or one block at a time and then after accessing that block the controller can decide to go either in the right direction or to the left direction or it can decide to rewrite whatever that is written over there it can just remove whatever it has written there and write something else okay and after it finishes computation so there are states here two states here one is the accept state one is the reject state whenever the computation finishes controller will move the control to one of these states accept state or reject state as soon as the machine goes into one of these states the computation will halt it will come to a stop and whatever is the state for example if it says accept then it will output accept and if it goes to r or reject it will output reject so there are only two possible outputs from this machine accept or reject okay and so far the problems that we have discussed uh, are also of the same kind for example we define a language and we say that does this string belong to the language right and the answer is yes it does belong to the language or no it does not belong to the language right so we will be solving such kind of problems and these kind of problems in the context of turing machines and in a broader concept of uh, computation theory are called decision problems so turing actually gave a solution to solve all such decision problems which arise in mathematics and computation so let me define so let's let's start with an example <clears throat> so
So as an example, let's consider the language N that consists of strings W, okay? And separated by a hash sign and then W again, such that W is one of the possible strings, any possible string over zero. Okay, remember this language L is not regular. Okay, this language L is not context free. You know why it is not context free and why it is not regular? Uh, we can prove that this language is not regular using pumping lemma and even we don't have to go to a pumping lemma, we can just look at this language WW since it contains exactly two copies of the same string w and we do not know what is the length of this w so it means that in order to recognize in order to accept this uh, this language the machine must have infinite memory which finite automata does not have so it cannot accept this language regular so this is not regular. so we cannot create a dfa or nfa this is not regular and last in the last lecture i told you that this language is not even not context free because in context free languages we only have access to we, we though even though we have access to an infinite memory that memory is restricted in a sense that it can only be accessed using a stack mechanism and in order to recognize this language we we don't have to we we cannot ex, we cannot recognize it using a stack we need a queue because we have exact same copy of w after the hash sign so as soon as we read the hash sign we need to read the same string again but since we do not have any access to store it so this language is not cfn right it's not context free but since turing machine is the most computed a powerful computation model so we assume that we would be able to construct a turing machine for this so let us construct a turing machine for this okay and even before we construct a turing machine i will i will show you that how this turing machine will work imagine there's a string which is zero one one zero 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 hash zero one one zero 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 okay does this string belong to the language n yes or no yes the answer is yes, yes because uh, if you consider this part of the string which is before the hash sign it's a string over zero and one, just some z some bunch of zeros and one. And after this hash sign, it, it is exactly the same string that we saw or read before the hash sign. So this string is in language L. This, this language is not regular. This language is not context-free, but we can recognize or accept this language using, using uh, Turing machine. Okay, so what we do? First of all, when this, string comes as the input to the Turing machine. So imagine there's a Turing machine here. Imagine there's a Turing machine here and this string X, let's call it X, comes here as the input. And this is the Turing machine M. So when this string X comes to the Turing machine, this string X will be copied on the tape. Okay, so this will be copied on the tape. So something like this. So this is the entire string. So once it, it copies the string on the ta tape, it puts a special symbol at the end of this string, this special symbol, which we call the blank symbol. Blank symbol signifies this is the end of the input. Okay. So you can imagine this end of the input as slash n in C++ or Java, right? So it is the end of the string usually. Anyway, so this is the input. And once the Turing machine starts, it will always start in the first block. Okay, this is the start of the string. All the strings are read from left to right. So what happens is this Turing machine reads zero. And as soon as it reads one character, what it does? It ignores everything and goes all the way till, till it finds the hash sign. When it finds the hash sign, it goes further and finds the first character that it reads and checks what is this character. Since this character that it read here was zero, so it wants a zero over here. 
do these characters match yes so if these characters match what it does so what it does it puts an x over here right so once it read a zero it put an x here and it goes all the way till the hash sign goes further and it sees what was the character here since it was zero so it puts a, a cross over there it, it crosses then it comes back all the way till it till it finds a cross when it finds a cross it moves one direction one step to the right and sees what is the character okay what is the character over here it's one so it remembers what it read so it will cross it go all the way till the hash sign till the cross sign and the first symbol that is not cross and check what is this character is this one yes was it one yes so it will cross this one and come back till the first cross then it will go one right come here it reads one and this is one so it will cross this one go all the way till the first character after the hash and cross and check what is this character if it is one and it was one so it will cross at this point if it finds that it, it it finds a zero rather than a one or a one rather than a zero it will immediately go into a reject state and it will reject it this way yes there is any question okay once it crosses here it will come back again and it will stop at the first symbol which is after the cross so how it would do it will go it will go all the way till the first cross then come to the right now it sees a zero it will cross it go all the way here checks what is the character here it is zero so it will cross come back here it finds zero so it will cross come here it finds a zero then come here zero and zero right once it crosses the last zero it will go all the way back here till it finds the first cross then once it finds the first cross it will go to the right but in the right there is a hash sign it means that it must have read the half of the input string right so it will go all the way here till it finds the cross last cross after the last cross it will find a blank symbol it means that for every character that it read here there was a matching character here and since in in this entire process it, it did not stop to in, in an error state so it finds here in the blank state and this means except so it will declare that this this string belongs to the language so it will accept it is this clear is this in clear that how it will work yes sir sir so uh, this tape will work differently for different languages right what which, which what will work differently with different the tape uh, the way that it worked for this language it's not tape. necessary that it works the same way right tape does not work anything tape is just a tape where we store symbols right we read symbols from the from the tape and we update symbols on the tape so it is possible yeah, sorry, to read a symbol from the tape and do nothing with the symbol or we can update it with some other thing and it is possible to skip everything that we have read so far and go to a certain specific symbol and then come back so so you can imagine there's a head of this uh there's a head of this turing machine this head moves around so it starts here then it moves to the right hand side then it moves to the left left hand side and so on so this head can move in any direction right one symbol one block at a time it can only move one block at a time but it can move anywhere for example if, if it wants to go from here to here then it will move it will keep reading till it finds here right so it will keep going to the right direction so so the steering machine uh, only stops when it goes to an accept state or reject state if it does not if it does not go to accept state or reject state it just keeps continuing its computation and we as the outsider sitting outside the machine looking at at this machine doing its job will have no idea about what is going on inside the machine we can only get an idea when the machine stops and it stops sir it, are to, there uh, accept state or or a reject state. yes sir are there any languages for which this turing machine goes into an infinite loop yes we will we will come to that okay okay is this in clear so i have not defined what is a turing machine i have just give you given you an example 
for a language for which we know that FA will fail, DFA will fail, we know CFG and pushdown automata will, will fail, but we were able to accept that string using a mechanism which, which is still not clear to us that how we define. So let us define. So, okay, nobody talked about break. Um, sir, can we have it right now? Do you want a break? Yes, sir, for the okay, month. So let's, Just for let's like 10 minutes, for 10 minutes. 10 minutes and we will come back. Okay, everyone here? Yes, sir. Okay, so let's start. <clears throat> so, uh, so we saw an example of a language uh, which cannot be accepted by traditional um, computation models, the weaker computation models, primitive. And then we saw a model which can uh, accept or recognize that thing and that's called a Turing machine. So as we do for all uh, models that we have seen so far, uh, let us define a Turing machine formally. So this is the formal definition of a Turing machine. So we say that, we say that a Turing machine a Turing machine is a seven tuple. Okay, there are seven things which define a Turing machine. Q, Sigma, Gamma, Delta, Q0, Q accept, Q reject. Okay. So Q is the finite set of states. It has to be finite. Okay. Sigma is the alphabet. It is fixed and finite. Okay. Gamma is the tape alphabet. If you remember what we did with the push down automata, so it, it has a very similar definition. And uh, <clears throat> it is again fixed and finite. There are other things which we say that the blank symbol is in the gamma. And Sigma, that is the alphabet, is a subset of gamma. Okay. Now the transition function. Transition function is is defined as this way. So we need to know what state the machine is in. We need to know what is on the tape symbol that the machine is reading right now. And based on these two things, machine decides which state to go to. Right. This so far everything is like finite automata. So it needs to know which state it starts and what is on the tape symbol, the current symbol that it is reading. And based on that information, it will decide which state to go. And based on it, it will also decide what to write back on the tape. Should it write anything on the tape? Should it ignore it or whatever, right? And it also would decide which direction to move the head of the machine whether to left direction or to the right direction. So this L means move the head to the left, R means move the head to the right. So this is our transition function. The rest are very easy. So Q0 is the uh, starting state. Okay. Q except is, is a different a designated except state. And Q reject is the designated reject state. So together, all these things belong to the set of states. Okay. There is nothing special about this definition. It's very similar to the definition that we have seen for DFA, NFA, CFG, and uh, PDA, and so many other things. So it's a very uh, similar definition. So what it, it tells us that that there is a separate tapes, tape alphabet. Tape alphabet is not necessarily same as the input alphabet. So input al alphabet means that 
our strings that are in the language are always over this alphabet. So if the alphabet is 0, 1, then all the strings this language except consist of 0, 1. If this alphabet is A, B, C, then all the strings this, this machine accepts or all the language, all the strings which are in this language are of the form that contain A, B, and C. While tape alphabet is a superset of whatever that is in the sigma, and these symbols are those symbols which we use in addition to the symbols that are in the alphabet. For example, the blank symbol, for example, the cross symbol that we, uh, that we found in the previous example. So where we, whenever we find a zero or one, we cross it and then go all the way to the right, right? So, so there are additional symbols which are contained inside the tape. So the tape alphabet contains everything that is in the alphabet of the language, plus it contains few more symbols, including the blank symbol and maybe some additional symbols, depending on the language and depending how we define our Turing machine. Now, the most important thing in this uh, Turing machine definition or any other such definition is the transition function. So transition function means that it has two things. So it has to know what is the current state. It has to know what is the current symbol that the machine is on in the tape. And based on this information, it will tell us, tell the machine which state to go, what to write back on, on the tape, and which direction to move the head of the tape, to the left or to the right. Okay. So let's, let, let us think about the interpretation of this machine. So we said that let M is Q, sigma, gamma, uh, delta, Q0, Q accept, and Q reject. Okay. Suppose M receives an input. Okay. And the input is W such that W is W1, W2, all the way till WN. And this W is over sigma star. Okay. okay. So this machine, when we say that the machine receives this input, so it means that M has W1, W2, WN on its first n squares or blocks on the tape. Okay. The rest of the tape, possibly infinite, is blank. Okay. Let me call it rest of the tape is black. Okay, so the rest of the tape is black. We don't have to show everything because it's possibly infinite. So showing one or two is enough. Uh, once the machine M starts the computation, the computation proceeds according to the transition. Okay, and computation continues. So the computation continues until it enters either the accept state or reject state. Okay, so it will keep continuing until it, it enters into uh, the accept state or reject state. As soon as it enters into one of those states, machine will come to a stop. We call it halt, right? So machine will halt, and whatever is the state, the output will be depending. Uh, it, it output will depend on that state. Okay. There are a few more things that we need to define for Turing machine, and we say that. So the most important thing is about the configuration of the Turing machine. So what is meant by configuration of a Turing machine? So, for example, let's consider a simple DFA, just a DFA. Suppose this is a DFA. Okay. 
So in this TFA, let's say this is state Q1, this is state Q2, and this state Q2 is, is our accepting or final state. So in this TFA, it is very simple what's happening. So suppose, suppose we say the machine, so let's say this machine, DFA M, suppose we say M is in state Q2. What does it tell us? It tells us that when the machine is in Q2, it must have read some zeros, possibly infinite zeros, and at least one one, right? Is it necessary that it must have read one zero or two zeros or three zeros? No, it may have read some zeros or it may not have read any zeros, but it must have read at least one one, right? So this is exactly the configuration of the machine is. That is in this particular instance during the computation, what is the state of the machine? For a DFA, it's very easy to explain and describe. For a Turing machine, it actually makes sense to describe the configuration. Okay, so what it is. For example, if I say I create a Turing machine here and there are so many states here, so many transitions and so on and so forth. We can define the configuration of the Turing machine as that. So there are a few things that we need to know. What is the current state? Okay. So what is the current state the machine is in? What is the current position of head in the tape? Right? Is the tape pointing to the first block or the second block or the fifth block or whatever block? So it has to know the current state of the machine. It needs to know what is the position of the head on the tape, right? So it needs to know what block. And together with this information, we also need to know what is the next state. If we know the transition function, we should be able to find out the next state. And after this next state, since whenever we apply a transition function, there is there are two changes that we do, possibly two changes. The first change is that we write something back to the tape or we may ignore it. So that is the machine can decide to ignore whatever that is written on the block and move on, or it may decide to write back onto the, onto the tape and then move on. So there's the first change that the machine does to the tape, right? I, that is, it can change some character on the tape. The second thing we need to know about is in which direction the tape, in which direction the machine moves to. Does it go to the right direction or to the left direction? So these are the two things which are important in finding the configuration of a Turing machine, right? So let me give you an example. So we do not know what Turing machine is or which, for which Turing machine this, uh, this transition uh, is, is, is there. Just imagine that the sigma is one zero, zero one. So I say that the configuration is one zero one one Q seven zero one 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 one. So this transition, this config, so this is called configuration. This configuration tells us something. That is the current state is Q7. The machine is in state Q7, okay? Okay, and it has already read these symbols. So if it is at the, at the block Z one, block two, block three, block four, then it has already, so it is in, in the block number four. These are the symbols, these are the symbols which are on the on the block, which is which are on the right of, right hand side of uh, of the head. Right. So if we if we if we want to show it on the tape, you know it's one, zero, one, one, zero, one, 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 one. So the machine is pointing to this symbol. This is the last symbol. And the current state is Q7. Okay, is this in clear?
okay no it has read these things so the current symbol is here sorry current symbol. this is the okay sorry okay now in this state so let's call it configuration c1 yes sir won't the current state or and the current position of the head be the same no 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 again can you repeat sir the current state and the position current position of the head will be the same every time why no i'm just asking is that is it like that no head and head and state are two different things head is this physical thing so not the physical thing of course there is no such thing as physical uh, equivalent in a turing machine but this has head is is the head of the machine which is just pointing to one of the blanks on on the day right so when we we, we know that this that when the machine starts it starts from the first block or the first square and as the machine progresses it decides either to go to the left hand side or to the right hand side so imagine that this machine is running for some time it has done some computation it has not yet finished and after some computation it arrives at this position that the head is moving head is pointing to the second zero in this uh, on the state and the current state is q7 which is mentioned here by q7 so this state is exactly the state that we had in the dfa like q1 q2 q3 q4 whatever okay so these are two different okay sir thank you so so this is the configuration c1 okay so suppose this is the configuration c1 now as i said that the transition function which depends on two things which is the current state and the current symbol that it is reading and based on this information it tells us what state to go to what symbol to write on 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 the on the tape and which direction to move the head right so over here over here suppose the transition function what transition function will be looking at transition function will be looking at the current state is q7 and it is pointing zero so based on this thing it will decide something right whether to stay in the same state or move to some other state whether to write back something on the tape or ignore it or to move the head of the machine to the left hand side or to the right side okay so if we know the transition function we will be able to find out what it will do but suppose we don't know the transition function what we know is that there is a c2 state that is the configuration that this machine goes after this one transition from c1 so we would say that c1 yields c2 if the tm can legally go from c1 to c2 in a single step okay okay is this in clear this is important to know about configuration because uh when we will look at different models so there are different versions of turing machine and when we are looking at different versions of turing machine uh, we will see that these configurations are important for us to understand Sir, okay so now, the states over here are defined in the transition uh, transaction function right so yes. the transition function yes okay. okay so now we have two things that i i would like to uh, mention suppose there is a turing machine and suppose the steering machine is f there is some input x okay and suppose there is a language l we do not know what is this language but there is some language l and we send a string x so this suppose this language is over some alphabet sigma okay now suppose this x is one of the string over this alphabet okay and we send this x to the machine how many possible outputs this machine has two accept and reject there are only two things right this machine does 
it either accepts x or it rejects x so what is it what does it mean by accepting or rejecting a particular string so we say that the string belongs yes m accepts x if x belongs to the language and m rejects x if x does not belong to that okay so this is very simple but let me uh, explain it more <clears throat> so for example if i have a language i do not know what language but suppose there is a language l and imagine there is a very simple alphabet and say 01 now for this language over 01 there are some strings which are in this language and there are some strings which are not in this language right for every string for every string for every string which is for every string x which is in this language l we want m to accept x right and for every string y which is not in the language l we want m to reject y right this is the objective this is the goal of designing a turing machine right and how does a turing machine accepts a string and how does it rejects the string it accepts the string x by performing some computation and then after when it finishes the computation it moves to q accept and how does it reject after it finishes the computation it moves to q reject right so whenever the machine goes to q accept the computation stops immediately it takes effect immediately and the output is provided by the machine that it accepts and as soon as the machine goes into q reject the computation stops immediately and it it outputs reject okay but the problem is but the problem is not for all languages not for all languages we can design a turing machine which always give an accept or a reject answer there is a third possibility and that is no answer so turing machine may accept it may reject but there is a third possibility and that possibility is reject what does it mean by the third possibility sorry the third possibility is no answer what is meant by no answer suppose the machine is doing its computation and the computer and the computation causes the machine to go into some kind of infinite loop that infinite loop will make the machine keep computing okay and it will never produce an answer now there are two possibilities possibility number 1 since we are we are we are outside the machine we do not see what is happening inside the machine so there are two possibilities either possibility number 1 there is an infinite loop and the machine is stuck in that infinite loop and it it cannot come out so it is not producing any answer yes or no because as as long as the machine is not i mean if the machine is not in q except or q reject it will keep working we do not know whether it's in infinite loop or it is doing something okay so this is one first possibility that it is in infinite loop the second possibility is that the input that we have provided is such a complicated input for the turing machine that it is taking a lot of time before it could produce an answer and for us as an outsider we do not know which case is this one so when to stop when to think that the machine is run into an infinite loop or when to think that the machine is still computing and hasn't reached an answer should it be after 1 second or 5 seconds or 1 minute or 1 hour one day or one year or a 1 billion year we do not know 
and we can never know so that's why every turing machine has three possibilities not every every turing machine many turing machines have these three possibilities either they always give you an answer which is accept or reject or sometimes they give you accept answer and sometimes they just go into an infinite loop okay not all machines do this thing but some machines do this okay so we we would classify turing machines based on this distinction so we say that a turing machine sorry a language l is called turing recognizable if some turing machine recognizes it and i will explain what is meant by recognizes okay l is also called recursively so we will use this turing recognizable and recursively enumerable interchangeable okay so the definition definition says that a language l is called turing recognizable if some turing machine recognizes it this definition does not give away any information that what is recognition so we say that so turing recognizability means that suppose there is a language l over some alphabet alphabet sigma and suppose there is some string x over this alphabet if if x belongs to l then m accepts x if x does not belong to l then m either rejects x or goes to in infinite loop if this is the case that it only accepts but sometimes it also goes to infinite loop without rejecting then then this is called turing recognition and the language is called turing recognizable but if it is not the case but if it is not the case and rather the case is that l is a language over some alphabet and there is a string x from this alphabet and if x belongs to the language l then turing machine m accepts x and if x is not in l then turing machine m rejects x then we say then we say l is turing decidable turing is uh, turing decidable and or, or we can say l is recursive okay so we have two things turing recognizable languages and turing decidable languages so what are turing decidable languages all those languages are called turing decidable languages such that whenever we give any string which is in the language the machine will accept it and whenever we give a string that is not in the language machine will reject it such languages are called turing decidable on the other hand if the machine is such that whenever the string is in the language it will accept it but when the when the language uh, when the string is is not in the language sometimes it will reject it sometimes it may go to to an infinite loop in such cases we say this machine this language is a turing recognizable okay so by this definition we know that if i consider all the set of turing decidable languages it is contained within turing recognizable languages because every language which is turing recognizable every language which is turing decidable is also by definition a turing recognizable right so this is contained within tr so td is contained within tr tr uh, so we can call it the set of recursive languages is contained within set of recursively 
innumerable languages. Okay, and over here I will stop and um, we will cover the rest of the things in the next class. So every Turing decidable language is Turing recognizable language, but not vice versa. Any questions? Yes, any questions? No, sir. Okay, so no questions then. Thank you very much. I will see you on Thursday. Uh, okay, so since the exam will be for one hour, so after the exam, uh, we will continue with that discussion. We will conduct the class, maybe a break of 15 minutes and then we will continue. Okay, so with that, I think we should stop the class. If you have any questions, just uh, let me know over the email and I will try to respond as quickly as possible. Somebody asked that, is there any uh, solution manual or solution available for the practice question? Uh, no, there are no solutions available for, with me. I haven't uh, solved all those questions in, in, a, in, in one, one place, so I don't have the solution. But if you have any question related to any, question, any practice question, please let me know and we will discuss. Um, sir, uh, is GNFA included in the exam? No, GNFA is not included. Okay, sir. But we should know how to uh, define a language for for find NFA, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. So what I would do tonight, I will uh, describe. I create a file and contain that will contain all the topics that are included in the exam. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you.